everyone. Good to see all the smiling, happy faces here. Welcome to all our online visitors. Hopefully Steve's out there watching us somewhere. How, uh, have we heard how Steve's doing? Is Steve doing good? Uh, yeah, he, put, uh, he commented on the Facebook last week. Okay. And, uh, he said he enjoyed the, the services. He's been watching us. Well, I'm very grateful for the Facebook and the, our chance to be out there. I personally know very little about it, but I'll leave that to the ones that do. And we saw his, one of his daughters yesterday in oh. town, and um, she said he was on his way somewhere else. Going to Virginia right now. Going to Virginia now? He'd be there by now. Oh, oh, he should be there by now. Okay. Visiting one relative after another, that's a great thing to get to do. Jenny was over for her test over there. We came out of the little room there, and then Renee was standing out there with her husband. Oh, Renee yes. was out there. Okay. I didn't recognize her. Jenny did. I walked on down the hall. She went all over her room, and Jenny kind of talked to her. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You've done the same thing to me, so. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're all here for tonight. Let's go ahead and turn over in the blue books to number 175. We're going to sing Standing on the Promises. If I remember what Gordon said, can't sing Standing on the Promises while you're sitting on the premises. So if you like to stand for Standing on the Promises of God. Standing on the Promises of Christ, my King. thankful to be here this evening. We're thankful for 
this day you've given us and for watching over us, protecting us. We just thankful, Heavenly Father, for your love and your care for each one of us. And may you take care of us each and every day. Pray you continue to watch over the church, protect us, and be with those who are having difficulties that you would strengthen and heal them. We're thankful that Dick and Susan were back today and he was praying for others who need to come back. And we just pray now that you'll continue to watch over the people that you uh, pray for our safety and for We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, let's see, I, I, does anyone need communion? Everybody good? Okay. Let's go ahead and turn right over then to number 50. stand on the promises so they change the words in here to trusting. Trusting on the promises. Okay. Well, it's mean, a good word, but... And that way you can sing it without standing up. Oh, I see. I see. There's always a loophole. <laughs> but not with God.
study uh, in the book of Philippians, and we're going to kind of go back and forth because we're going to be in Isaiah for, like David said, maybe a year and a half, so uh, give you a break from that, do some New Testament, uh, so um, so we're going we're gonna to look at the book of Philippians, except don't turn to Philippians, uh, because... Um, this evening, I want to look at the planting of that church. Uh, there aren't too many churches that Paul writes a letter to where you can actually go and find the story background, you know, behind that church and how it was planted, and some stories about some of the people that were a part of that church. Uh, but with the, the book of Philippians, we can do that because uh, in the book of Acts, we have quite a bit of information about some of the people that were involved in uh, beginning that church and how Paul worked in their lives. And uh, so uh, that's where I want to begin uh, this evening is just kind of looking at uh, Paul planting that church and, and some of the, the members that were, were told about that, that attended that church. So, so if you want to turn to Acts chapter 16, that's where we're going to be this morning, I mean this evening. <laughs> Babies will do that too. <laughs> it's easy to do it today. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be starting in verse 6. Father, thank you for all the books of the Bible and how each one of them gives us different things to think about. And um, But we know that as, as you spoke through Paul, that all of it is god breathed and it's helpful for our instruction and so we just pray that you would instruct us tonight help us to learn from your word and uh, from this church we ask it in jesus name amen so we're going to start at verse 6 of chapter 16. And paul and his companions traveled through the region of pergia and galatia having having uh, been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Messia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Messia, and they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had, had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we went out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and uh, the next day to Neapolis. 
from there we travel to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. So in the region of Galatia, where uh, Paul and Barnabas made their first missionary trip, uh, Paul had started uh, several churches there, and so the first thing he and, he and Silas do is they encourage the, the Christians there in Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And after they had strengthened those churches and encouraged them from their first missionary trip, then they decided to uh, kind of explore new territory, start some new churches. So they want to go further west and, um, you know, spread the gospel even further. So it seemed natural for them to go west into to Asia Minor, uh, where you had cities like Ephesus and Philadelphia, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, and Smyrna. Now all these should sound very familiar because we just went through the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, and so those, those uh, cities would actually all have churches eventually. But at this time and place, uh, the Spirit uh, was directing Paul in, in a different direction. It wasn't the right timing. God has a timing for everything. And maybe they just weren't ripe yet. To, to be ready to receive the gospel and or some or but he just wanted to push him up into Philippi because he knew that that was a ripe area and that's where God wanted uh, to start a church but um, so they were kept from going into this this area of, of Asia Minor they call it Asia or Asia Minor but it's really Turkey um, that's what we're talking about so so somehow the Holy Spirit uh, shut the door and prevented them from going there. Um, and uh, that left them only one way to go north. Uh, so they said, you know, God's leading us to Bithynia. And this was another region uh, to the north. So they tried to enter Bithynia. But the Holy Spirit also had something to say about that as well. Because in verse 7 it says, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go there either. So, uh, so the Holy Spirit has, you know, been shutting all these doors, and sometimes we experience that in our lives. You know, we try to go through a door, seems like the right thing to do, and somehow God shuts it, go to another door, God shuts that one, and, uh, you know, he directs us. I, I feel just as much as he did uh, for Paul and uh, some of the apostles in their lives and just directing them with what they should do uh, But Paul was persistent. You know, he didn't give up. He, he was determined. He knew that God had some sort of plan um, And so they knew they were forbidden to go in these other areas But they, they decided to go to the coastal town of Troas and they waited there for God's instruction they waited to to hear from him and here we find in this passage, you know, that Paul was persistent. He, he didn't give up. He had very thick skin. Um, and, uh, you know, he was faithful and he was determined and he knew that God, God was behind him and that God would use him and God had used him for uh, several churches already uh, to be someone that could plant these churches and then get them going and then go back and encourage them and Establish them. So, you know, he, he's, a, he's a good example that you just keep going and you just keep praying about it, asking God to, to direct you. And so, sometimes uh, God tests us in this way, you know, and we don't under, always understand why he does the things he does. But, you know, we can't uh, get discouraged about it because usually there's, it's, it's better that he didn't let you go through that particular door because... We don't know all the reasons why, but it probably would have been worse for us if we had gone through it. So, but, uh, so they traveled through Messenia to this place called Troas. Now, Troas was named after Alexander Troas, or Alexander the Great. And uh, about 10 miles away from Troas was the city of Troy, which you have all those, uh, you know, stories. <laughs> And then in verse 9, God, God gives the, the, the missionaries this direction that they've been looking for. So in verse 9, it says, during the night, Paul gets this vision from this man in Macedonia. And he's standing there and begging him 
come over to Macedonia and help us. So while they had a couple doors shut, there was a clear open door. There wasn't any question about where God wanted them to go, right? So they had this call of God came in this dream, and um, while they're in Troas, and uh, they, it says, and that's Paul, Silas, and Timothy at this point, um, but then someone else joins them at Troas, and it's Luke, uh, because in verse 10 it says, after Paul, it's in the vision, and then the next word is we, and Luke is the one that's writing the book of Acts, uh, so Luke joins them at this point, um, maybe because they needed a doctor to go with them, or, or maybe he just wanted, you know, he knew he wanted to write about the, the travels and the missionary journeys of Paul, um, but for whatever reason, he joins this, this group, and um, so there's four of them at, at this point. Now this vision, it's... Uh, it's an incredible turning point in history when you look at if you look at all the different places that the gospel has been and um, it turned Paul to go west into Europe and what was the result of that well all of you know Europe was Christianized and that you know a lot of those people came overseas and and started churches here in America so can you imagine, you know, if they had gone in a different direction, we might not be here today. Uh, if Paul had gone to the east, if he'd gone into India and China, instead of, you know, west into Europe, uh, it would have been a different story, right? But in Macedonia, um, we know that today is Greece, so it's just Greece. When we say Macedonia, that's the area of Greece, and... Well, Macedonia is named for Philip of Macedon, and Philip of Macedon was the father of Alexander the Great. And so from this region of Macedonia, Philip and Alexander, and they had once ruled the world, you know, and uh, so this was a great calling, you know, for these four men to go into this Greek culture and uh, to preach in these cities. Um, Alexander the Great and, and Philip of Macedon and other guys like Plato, Aristotle, Homer, Socrates, you know, all those guys came from this area. So what a mission field, you know, to be able to preach to the to the Greeks who had given the world all this culture and art and sports and philosophy and all these kinds of things. So it was it was a great mission field, I'm sure, to be a part of. And uh, Greece was the ruling power before Rome came into power. So it was, you know, kind of dominated the world, and then after Greece was, was Rome, but... So, um, Paul and his companions had this choice, this chance to, you know, to go into Greece and to change things forever. And also, one thing about the Greeks, you know, the, the Bible was written in the Greek language, because the Greek language, that when Alexander conquered the world, he pushed the Greek language in all these different parts of the world, so it spread... And so Greek was kind of the dominant uh, language of the day. And that's why the Bible is written in Greek. But verse 11 says, From Troas, uh, we set out to sea, and we sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. So Samothrace is a little island, kind of halfway between Troas and Neapolis. And so they were headed to the mainland, and so they had to stop there. And... Uh, then they head to Neapolis, and uh, and uh, this is kind of the port of Philippi. Philippi was about ten miles inland, um, so you come into Neapolis, and then you have to walk ten miles to go up to Philippi. And the the city it stood on this steep hill, and it was encircled by two rivers. And Philippi uh, got its name from. Philip of Macedon. <laughs> so, um, and they were interested in uh, the gold mines that were in and around that area. And so they arrived at Philippi, and when Paul first went into the city, uh, the first thing that he would normally do was go to the synagogue, because he, he, he always kind of had this as his mission 
uh, interest was to go to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. But So you would stop in uh, to the, uh, the synagogue, wherever the synagogue was located, and then he would uh, move on into uh, the, where the Gentiles were at. Um, but he went to the Jews first, uh, partly because the synagogue would give him a place to speak, and uh, it was a good place to, to spread the good news of Jesus. And Paul had always had a, a heart for the Jewish people because he was one. Another reason he went to the Jews first is that sometimes when he went to the synagogues and preached to these, the Jews there, he would win some converts. And then he would use those converts to go out and reach the, the Gentile group. So it was kind of a good starting off place. And they already kind of had a foundation for what Paul is going to talk about, because all of the Old Testament, you know, the Jews had all of that, and they knew all of that, and then just to, if they could accept the fact that Jesus was the promised Messiah from the Old Testament, um, but sometimes, you know, it, it worked okay, and he had some Jewish converts, but most of the time, uh, he had a problem making Jewish converts, and usually he made more Gentile converts. Uh, but um, he's not able to do that here in Philippi because they didn't have a synagogue there. Now, there was a Jewish rule that you had to have 10 men, uh, 10 Jewish men in an area to start a synagogue. Um, so it didn't matter how many women you had, you couldn't start a synagogue unless you had 10 men. Um, and so he went there and searched, and there wasn't, there wasn't a synagogue there. But he inquired where maybe some of the Jewish believers might be at, so he, he discovered that they were meeting at the, at the river. There were some Jewish women there, kind of this unofficial group that were meeting by the river to pray on the Sabbath day. And so Paul headed to that place, and um, it was far from the temple. It's sad that, you know, the Jews got scattered because of some of the the, the discipline that God had to bring, and some of some of them never came back. You know, they're scattered to these far corners of the earth. But um, so a lot of times they would start these synagogues, and that was the next best thing if they couldn't ever get back to the temple. But but in Philippi, there's just a few women, and uh, but they're meeting uh, faithfully and they're praying. And so we'll pick it up in verse 13. It says, "On on the Sabbath, we went outside." Uh, the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer, we sat down, and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. And the, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her own. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, Come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. So her name is Lydia, but Lydia is also uh, the name of the area where she came from. So she's Lydia from Lydia. Uh, so Lydia was uh, it was the region in Asia Minor, in that little area uh, near the area of the city of Thyatira. Now the Thyatira was an important city, like uh, I was mentioning earlier, you know, we studied about it. it's one of the seven churches that Jesus addressed in uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And so there was eventually a church that was planted there. Um, but uh, they've also discovered that there, there was a large Jewish synagogue there, and so maybe that's where um, Lydia may have been, uh, you know, converted. And so she, she was a Gentile lady, but she was living in, in Thyatira, and she became a God-fear. And so she had turned her heart from the false pagan gods, you know, that were around uh, for the Gentile people. And she recognized that, that Yahweh was, was the one true God. And so that was kind of the beginning of her, her spiritual pursuit. She was one of those women that was meeting at the river to pray. And Thyatira was very famous for a purple dye. Uh, Homer in the Iliad said that the art of the woman in Thyatira and the surrounding area is an art of dyeing with purple. 
And so we have this historical evidence, uh, you know, besides what the Bible says, that this is a place where, you know, they would have this purple dye. Now, the Bible speaks of, of Thyatira, and um, it's very interesting. There were two, actually, kinds of, of dyes that they would use. One was a very rich dye, and uh, most of the people that wore purple clothing were the royalty because they were the only ones that could afford it. Um, and they used to extract this dye, this purple dye, drop by drop from these little creatures called the Amurex, and it was a shellfish. And they would catch these shellfish and they would extract drop by drop this expensive uh, purple dye. Now that was the, the good purple, the, the ones that the kings would buy because it was really expensive uh, to, to use that for clothing. Um, but then there was kind of the second class dye that they used to make purple, and uh, they got that from extra extraction from the Manor Root, and that Manor Root grew around the city of Thyatira there. So um, they would, they would uh, make this purple dye, and they would dye this, all these clothes, and so that was what Lydia did, you know. So, and then she came to Europe from Thyatira, and she came to Philippi, and uh, she, she was part of those, those women, women there. Um, and, you know, I think it's very significant that the first people that Paul reached in Europe were women. You know, because a lot of times people give Paul a hard time, and he's kind of a male chauvinist, and the women can't preach, and all these things, you know. But, you know, he, he just had these women, and he's, he didn't go somewhere else. He worked with these women, and he established a, a church, you know. So um, his attitude was really quite the opposite. You know, and the Pharisees wouldn't have even bother. Um, but, you know, he... He's been saved by Christ, and he's learning new things, and the, the women are just as valuable, and he, so he's, he's saving Gentiles, which the Jewish people wouldn't look at either, and then he's spending time with women, and men also, slaves, so, you know, Paul has a new perspective, and so he's ministering to, to these women, and the first thing we notice about Lydia um, in her conversion was that, that she feared God, so she... Like I said, she had worshipped God. She had come out of this culture of these false gods. And she had turned to the one true God, Yahweh. Um, but, you know, she wasn't uh, a Christian yet. She was just a, a God-fearer who uh, would worship with the Jewish people. Um, and so, like, you know, this morning we were talking about the court of the Gentiles, uh, where they would uh, have the... When you would bring your animal sacrifices and make all the exchanges and all that. Well, that's where the Gentiles could would come to the, the outer court. The, the, the God fears, they could come to this area. You could you could fear the Lord and you could worship him. And Lydia, she sought to know the Lord, you know, and that was the first step that was the beginning of her salvation. She didn't know Christ yet, but she was uh, she did respect the, the Jewish faith. And she did believe in Yahweh. And um, so she was one of those, like other, other um, Gentiles in the book of Acts, like Cornelius and, and the Ethiopian. And so she just had the seeking heart for God. And when these people had a seeking heart for God, you know, you find God. Because that, the scripture says that, right? So Jesus says, if you seek the Lord, you're going to find him. If you seek him with all your heart and all your soul. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find, right? Knock and the door will be open. I think God respects that. When people were seeking him, he made the gospel, you know, available to them. So that's what happened. And then um, Lydia, she listened, you know. When Paul came, she, she listened to what he had to say. She was open uh, to the gospel. And... Um, and so she heard Paul's message with faith, and uh, you know, the Roman says faith comes by hearing, right? <clears throat> she heard, and then, um, <clears throat> and then uh, it says that God opened her heart. Now, that doesn't mean that the door of her heart was forced open by God, you know, He didn't make her become a Christian. 
Um, but, you know, it's just that she was searching for it and God made it available to her so that she could understand it and accept it. And um, so he was cultivating her heart. The seed had been planted. God was nourishing those seeds, helping them to grow. And she was coming to this understanding of who God was and who Jesus was. And uh, so she was receiving, she was receiving the gospel here. And um, she responded with her life. And also it says all of her household were baptized. So she and all of her household uh, were baptized. And uh, so she became a Christian that day. And uh, she accepted the Lord. So she was one of the members of the church. Not only her, but all of her household. We don't know how many were in her household. Um, could have been a lot, or could have been just a few, but but uh, her whole household were part of that first church. And then in verse sixteen, uh, we read about somebody else that was converted and became part of the church. It says, once when we were uh, going to a place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. And she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. And when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and they dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, and he fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And once all the prison doors flew open, everyone's chains came loose, the, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. And the jailer called for lights. And he rushed in and he fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then uh, brought them out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and they washed and washed their wounds. Then, <clears throat> then immediately he and his household were baptized. And the jailer brought them into his house and he set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And when it was daylight, the magistrates sent for sent their officers to the jailer with this order, release those men. And the jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we were Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. And the officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. And they came to appease them and escort them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. And after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them, and then they left. So first of all, you have this, this young uh, slave girl who had this evil spirit, and uh, she made her masters rich by interpreting signs and fortune-telling and 
her masters, you know, they were exploiting her condition. And uh, Paul and Silas, uh, they pass by and she starts shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, you might think that that's a good thing, you know, because they get free publicity. <laughs> right? But having a demon possess crazy woman affirming your ministry isn't the such a good thing. <laughs> uh, and she was tagging along with them, you know, like she's part of their ministry. And so they're like, well, if she's a part of your group, well, maybe I don't want it, you know? Because. Um, they would see this association. So if Paul had accepted these demons' words, even though they were true, it would seem like the gospel and the demonic activity are working together, you know. So Paul was annoyed by her behavior and uh, commands the demon to come out of her. And it comes out immediately, and everyone notices, you know, the change in her. And that uh, a miracle has taken place, but not everyone was grateful for this miracle uh, because her, own, her owners were horrified that the spirit was gone because they couldn't make any money anymore. And uh, the, the marketplace was primarily the, the gathering place in the city, not only for social life, but for business, also law and education and things like that. But Paul and Silas, they were arrested there and dragged before the authorities in the marketplace. They were charged for throwing the city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for Romans to accept or to practice. And neither one of those charges were true. In reality, you know, he, healing this demon-possessed girl, that was kind of aiding to the peace, right, of the town and the public, not disturbing the peace. And uh, faith in Christ was hardly a capital offense in the Roman Empire, at least at this time. Uh, later on, it would be. Uh, but at this time, um, they were just kind of seen as a sect of the Jewish people. They weren't seen as a, a separate group, group of people, and they weren't really persecuted a whole lot yet. But uh, the crowds, they get in on this attack, and they were, they were likely upset because they had lost something too, you know? Some of these guys were going to this woman for fortune telling and find, predicting their future and all that. So, so maybe that's why they, they were upset. Um, and there might, might have also been some uh, anti Jewish prejudice going on because there weren't, like I said, there weren't very many Jewish people there. They didn't even have 10 men to start a synagogue. And so then when they find out these guys are Jews, maybe there could be could have been some prejudice, we don't know. But anyway, they kind of became easy targets. And the, the magistrates, not knowing all the facts, um, had them stripped and beaten, and then after flogging them, they were thrown into prison. And this jailer was, was ordered to, to keep them securely. And uh, maybe the jailer put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks and Maybe he had heard some of the stories, you know, because there were stories about, you know, these Christians escaping out of prisons. Uh, because, you know, this is 16 chapters in the book of Acts, and several times when they had arrested uh, the apostles and everything, remember, they, the, the angels would come and take them out of the, of the prison. Um, but all of this, it, it didn't dampen the spirits of, of Paul and Silas, you know, uh, they have a great attitude in this. They're being persecuted unjustly. You know, they didn't even get a trial or anything. And they, they had their, their rights taken away from them because they were Roman citizens. But they just start praying and singing hymns to God, you know, in the midst of their, of their persecution. And I, I so much want to be like that. You know, I think I fall into the why me category uh, instead of... And breaking out in song, you know, when we were persecuted. But, uh, but it's a good example to look at and to try to imitate. Um, and so well, they're in there and singing, and then suddenly uh, God brings on this, this violent earthquake. And uh, God's displaying his power, and uh, the prison doors 
fly open to, and then everyone's chains on top of that become loose. So this jailer knows that something's going on beyond just the ordinary, you know, this is supernatural, something's happening. And uh, so when he saw, you know, all the doors open and everybody's chains off and everything, he was, he was ready to take his life because letting these prisoners escape was a capital offense. And, you know, instead of having them take your life, a lot of times people chose to take their own life, you know, before that could happen. But, you know, surprisingly, Paul and Silas, uh, nor anybody else, because they weren't the only ones in the prison. So maybe they had talked to the other prisoners, I don't know, but um, everybody was still in their prison cells, even though all the doors were open. And, uh, but Paul knew there was an opportunity here, not just to run for their lives. And they don't need to do that. They know God's behind them. I mean, God's the one that opened the doors, after all. But... They knew, Paul at least knew, that God always had something in mind for the gospel to be shared. Trying to take advantage everywhere he went, whether he was in a prison cell or out on the streets, to use that opportunity, you know, to share the gospel with somebody. And so, Paul and Silas, you know, they use this for the glory of God, and they stay put, and um, they know that God's behind this, and so... God is about to bring something good out of this situation, and he's about to save this, this Philippian jailer and all of his family as well. So, you know, the gospel reaching this jailer would have been very hard under normal circumstance, right? Here he is, he's working inside of this prison. There's not very many people to get in the prison except for if you are a prisoner. So the Maybe, you know, God allowed for those events to happen so that this jailer could have a chance to hear the message because he knew that his heart would be open to that. But whatever the case, God used it to, to touch his heart. And um, so he fell down for Paul and Silas and recognized, maybe he had heard some things about them uh, and uh, recognized that they were sharing this gospel. Maybe he had overheard some conversations they'd been talking about in the cell room, too, you know. But uh, he asked them how he could be saved, and he invited uh, Paul and Silas into his home. And uh, he also he gathers all of his family around, and so they hear this message of salvation. And uh, the jailer, it says, watched their physical wounds that they had. And while he was washing their physical wounds, Paul was washing their, his spiritual wounds and uh, got them all baptized. Him and it says all of his household uh, were baptized as well. So, uh, so you have uh, this jail and all of his family, <clears throat> and you also have... Uh, Lydia and all of her family that were a part of this first church. Then these magistrates, you know, they had made all these mistakes and done all these things that were, it was illegal to flog a Roman citizen, period. And, and, um, and if you're a Roman citizen, you also had the right to a fair trial. And both Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, so they were both denied that. And, um, so no one had the authority to beat them or imprison them or flog them and uh, without the permission of Rome, if Rome had decided that. But Paul knew that uh, these magistrates, that they were in serious trouble because they had done all these things. And so um, he wasn't going to go quiet, quietly, you know. He says, you guys come and escort us out, you know. And, uh, and this would also be kind of a, a public display. If the magistrates came and they escorted Paul and Silas out of town, you know, then that would be showing that they had made a mistake. They were taking them out of the prison, they had put them in, now they were taking them out. So at least it kind of cleared their, their name. Um, so that they, everyone would know that they were vindicated of what, what had happened. Um, And also, I think it also helped the church because, you know, they recognized that they were Christians. They were just starting this church. 
And because they had made this mistake with them, it's probably unlikely they would have made that same mistake again, you know, for the people that were uh, starting out this church that, that Paul was starting in Philippi here. So, And then it says, before Paul and Silas leave Philippi, they met with the church one last time. So, um, you know, it must have been an encouraging prayer meeting. Now, there might have been other people that uh, were converted during their time there. Uh, it, these, just that these are the only stories that are put in the scriptures, so they're the only ones that, that we know about. But at least we know there were two families involved, Lydia's family and the jailer's family. And um, so, but he met with, the, with the, these new converts. And, um, and so here we have, you know, Lydia and her household. They were hungry for the truth. They embraced the message. Uh, that was brought by Paul and his companions, and and then this Gentile Roman soldier and his family, who also had encountered the gospel in, in this very bizarre way. And, uh, you know, Paul and Silas, you know, they came to spend a couple nights in this jail cell, and God just used that for a, a positive situation. This Philippian church, uh, I think, Paul had one of the richest uh, relationships with this church because you'll see as we get into this letter, um, Paul just had his spirit seems to be extra. I mean, it's normally lifted and he's usually has a good attitude, but especially in his relationship with this Philippian church because he pretty much doesn't hear anything negative to say. It's it's all pretty much positive. It's it's even called the the epistle of joy uh, because he uses the word joy and rejoice so much in the but we'll meet a few other members of the church as we get into the letter itself. But anyway, I, I just thought just some background on uh, how Paul started this church. A couple of the members that were part of this church kind of gives you, you know, just a, a mindset of, of the people that he dealt with. They were also the church that helped him the most financially in his ministry that had sent him more than once uh, a great deal of money when he was in trouble. And they were the poorest church that Paul had uh, been a part of. So they, even though they were poor, they had constantly sent him money on uh, different occasions and helped him out. And so anyway, he had a great relationship uh, with, the, with this church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, Paul and thank you for his heart to spread the gospel far and wide everywhere that uh, that he would go, that he was, had all these opportunities to, to plant churches and in every situation that he was in, he used that as an opportunity to, to spread the gospel and to, to, sh to share the name of Jesus with, with anyone that would listen. And we, we thank you for uh, the Philippian church and the impact that they had on his life and we just pray as we go through it Lord that you will just help us to recognize things that we need to to learn things we need to correct in our lives pray that your Holy Spirit would, would speak to us convict us where we need to be convicted encourage us where we need encouragement Lord and that we can just be blessed by by studying uh, this letter to the Philippians we we ask this in Jesus name Yeah, you know, that, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, couldn't quite get it exactly on the subject, but I thought I'd put it up with a good closing song. Since I'm doing standards, we'll go back to a standard. You know, I can st stand and sing our closing song, number 389, I Am Resolved No Longer to Linger. Number 389.